Hello and uh, welcome to Biz Talk. And this is a program which we will discuss on matters concerning the national key economic areas and the companies that are involved directly or indirectly to the economic transformation program. And I am your host, Suryati Sanusi. And for this week, we will be discussing on the education industry, specifically medical sciences. But before that, let's take a look at how the market did for the week just ended. Now, Bursa Malaysia is set to stage a technical rebound next week after the recent oversold position. An analyst said bargain hunters is likely to dominate following a five-day slide in the key index, pushing the key index toward next resistant level of 1,665 level. He said bullish headlines from local corporate and earnings too will boost risk appetite on key blue chips like Air Asia that is said to be in talks to buy a Korean airline and eyeing three initial public offerings. In addition to this, he said the surprise cut in Brazil's interest rate, better than expected Australian employment data and well-received Italian debt auction would likely to generate a strong reversal in local bonds. And on Friday to Friday basis, the FBM KLCI ended 6.87 points lower at 1,653.36 compared with 1,660.23 the previous Friday due to heavy profit taking. Now on to Ringgit. In contrast, the Ringgit meanwhile is expected to experience cautious trading against the US dollar as market participants sidelined amid uncertain global development. They said renewed worries on when and whether Spain would seek a bailout would be the main focus among investors next week, prompted investors to sell off riskier currencies, including Ringgit. In addition to this, they said lack of market moving news on local front too, expected to discourage investors to take heavy position. On a weekly basis, the ringgit depreciated against the US dollar to 3.0570 from 3.0535 last Friday. Now, meanwhile, crude palm oil or CPO futures prices on Bursa Malaysia derivatives is expected to be lower within 2,300 ringgit and 2,400 ringgit per tonne next week. Nevertheless, a trader said the weaker price will continue to attract physical buyers into the market, making demand for the commodity more stable. He said sentiment too remained positive as investors applauded government's move to reduce the export duty for CPO to ease stockpiles. The Ministry of Plantation, Industries and Commodities announced Friday that effective January 31st, 2013, the CPO export tax rate would be between 4.5% and 8.5%, depending on prevailing prices and be fixed on a monthly basis for Malaysia to remain competitive. And on a Friday to Friday basis, benchmark month December 2012 increased 85 ringgit to 2,500 ringgit per tonne. On the physical market, October South improved 150 ringgit to 2,400 ringgit per ton from 2,250 ringgit per ton last week. Now, on to the rubber, Dilla said uh, it were expected to be volatile next week amid uncertain global sentiment. They said it would be difficult to predict the trend next week as prices would most probably be influenced by the announcement by the Department of Statistics recently that Malaysia's natural rubber production dropped 14.9% in August this year. External factors, namely developments in the United States and Europe too, would also have negative impact on the rubber market. Now, now, on to a Friday to Friday basis, the Malaysian rubber bought seller's official physical price for tire grade SMR20 fell 10 cent to 922 cent per kilogram, while latex in bulk eased 5 cent to 640 cent per kilogram. And as for the Kuala Lumpur tin market, KLTM is expected to hover around 22,000 US dollars a ton next week, tracking price movements on the London Metal Exchange LME. Adela said the market price direction remains uncertain due to economic reasons stemming from the prolonged unsettled Eurozone debt crisis. Sellers are not so keen to sell if tin price falls below 22,000 US dollars a ton, he said. On a week on week basis, tin price fell by 500 US dollars to settle at 22,000 US dollars a ton. Right. Right, and uh, that was our weekly market report. And we'll take a short break right now. And uh, when we come back, I'll introduce you to our guest for this week.
Prem Rawat, widely known by the honorary title Miraji, has dedicated his life to spreading a simple message that each person has a source of peace and fulfillment inside themselves. His message is from the heart. He speaks about the possibility for each person to find peace within, regardless of circumstances. If you are looking for fulfillment and peace, he says, the solution lies within. If that is what you want, I can help. Want more information or to apply for licenses, approvals or permits easily? Visit the Malaysian Business Licensing System of LESS at www.bless.gov.my to enjoy this facility. Contact us at 03 88881717 for more information. Bless business made simple. Right, thanks for staying with us on Best Talk. If you have any comments, you can email us at bestalk at pranama-tv.com or you can tweet us at bestalk502 or you can call us right now at 0326 937008. Right, our topic for this week is Building Health Sciences Education Discipline Cluster. And to discuss more on this topic, we have Professor Charles M. Wiener, Founding Dean and Chief Executive Officer of Pradana University Graduate School of Medicine of Park Sum uh, as our guest for this week. And uh, a short introduction on uh, Professor, Professor Charles. He moved from Baltimore, Maryland to Kuala Lumpur in January 2011 to develop Park Sum. And Professor Charles remains a professor of medicine and physiology at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And uh, from 2000 to 2011, he was the vice chairman of the Department of Medicine and, and director of the Osler Medical Training Program at Johns Hopkins Hospital and he attended the University of Miami School of Medicine after graduating from Duke University with a degree in Management Science and prior to beginning a fellowship in Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Johns Hopkins, Professor Charles was an American Heart Association British American Research Fellow in the Respiratory Physiology Unit of the Hammersmith Hospital in London. And during his free time, if he has any, he is an enthusiastic <laughs> sailor and a squash player and also a badminton player now that he is, Mala he is in Malaysia and has three children with wife Anne Rompalo, MD, also a professor at Johns Hopkins and Paxum. Did I get everything right? Everything right. Perfect. Everything right. Well, nice anyway, show. welcome to Bistog and uh, thank you for you know, spending time with us and to discuss on the, this matter. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting right. me. Let's uh, start with uh, the first question. Can you, tell, can you tell us about the collaboration between John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins and University and uh, Putra? Perdana University, sorry. So the, the collaboration between Johns Hopkins and Perdana University began around 2009, 2010, where uh, Tansri Dr. Mohan Swami, um, representing a public-private partnership from Malaysia, mm -hmm. sought out and cl connected with folks at Johns Hopkins, my superiors, and they agreed that they had a common interest in developing a new model of a graduate entry medical school, mm -hmm. an academic health science center that uh, uh, was based on the tripartite mission of research, clinical care, and education. Right. And Malaysia was considered fertile ground for extending Johns Hopkins' footprint into the global environment. Johns Hopkins has a number of um, endeavors already in, throughout the world, but nothing so ambitious as this educational endeavor that we're setting up in Malaysia. But why Malaysia? Why so Malaysia, Malaysia, uh, Malaysia is, I think, the perfect country for what Johns Hopkins was looking for. Mm -hmm. And then when, uh, when the folks from Malaysia sought Johns Hopkins out, it, it was a, a perfect marriage. John, uh, Malaysia has a 
highly intact, highly professional infrastructure in health mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. So that um, not a lot of foundation building was necessary. Mm -hmm. There is a, um, it is a country that is developing and it is moving from the um, kind of the, the diseases of communicable diseases to unfortunately first world diseases, right. things that Johns Hopkins has a lot of expertise in. Right. And the, the movement towards graduate entry medical education is starting to take a foothold in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Singapore uh, opened a gra the first graduate en entry uh, program uh, mm -hmm. about six years ago. Right. But Malaysia has a lot more infrastructure, a lot more people, right. a lot more potential. Uh, so it was thought to be a perfect collaboration for Johns Hopkins. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about the graduate entry? Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Graduate entry is, is the growing model in medical education worldwide. Mm -hmm. Um, what it means is that you do not start medical school until you've completed a university degree already. Right. So after finishing secondary school, you go get, get a first degree. And you mentioned that I had mine in management science. I right. did not go straight into medicine. So, right. I actually have an economics and management degree prior to starting medical school. Right. Um, and and the the notion of starting medical school when you're a little bit older mm -hmm. uh, is becoming more appealing to the world as the as people start entering the workforce at a more mature point. Right. Um, almost all, a lot of schools in uh, many of the British Commonwealth schools right. in Britain, Australia, Singapore are moving towards uh, at least offering the graduate entry model. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's in, in the new, in, in the 2000, in, in this millennium, mm -hmm. I think it's a better model for training physicians. Right. You talked about that we, Malaysia, we have, have the best infrastructure to start this medical uh, school, but do we have enough educator here, local educator? Lo local educators. Yeah. There's many outstanding educators in many, I mean, um, as, as you know, Malaysia has a plethora, mm -hmm. possibly too many medical schools right now. Right. There are many highly talented uh, educators, both in the public and the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, many of whom I've, I've been fortunate to recruit, right. uh, many more who I'd love to recruit. Right. Let's talk about accredited. Has uh, Perdana University been accredited by the Malaysian Medical Council? Yes. We will not receive full accreditation until we graduate our first class. Right. We enrolled our first class in September 2011. Mm -hmm. They will come, it's a, since it's a four-year degree, not a five- or six-year degree like mm -hmm. um, the rest of Malaysia, they will complete their studies in May of 2015 right. and the rules in Malaysia are that you cannot become fully accredited until you graduate your first class. Do you know why? I think that's I think that's a rational they they want they want schools to show that you can start and finish. Right. And so we have provisional accreditation. We have all of our up-to-date accreditations, mm -hmm. but we will not be fully accredited until we graduate our first class. Until 2015, then. To 2015. Okay. What kind of criteria or qualifi what qualification one must have to enroll in uh, Perdana University? To enroll in Perdana University, you have to have completed a first degree in a science, science, preferably in a science. Okay, preferably. Preferably in a science. Uh, you have to have had a grade point average of 3.45 or above, mm -hmm. and then you have to complete our individual application. The application process to Perdana to Pugsam is um, independent. Right. So you apply directly to us. We screen people who are qualified. We interviewed all qualified applicants, right. uh, Malaysian and international. Right. And then you have to um, uh, convince our faculty that you are committed to uh, a, a career in medicine, right. that you're looking to improve the nation, improve health, right. uh, do research, clinical care, education, and also that you can uh, uh, complete our rigorous curriculum. Right, but that's kind of high, 3.5 uh, points, which is, you know, that's a kind of high standard. Why is that? So that was a, a requirement put on by the uh, MQA and the MMC. Right. I think what they're looking for is for us to be, if we're billing ourselves as an outstanding, high quality, mm -hmm. world class institution, okay. that they want only the most successful students to uh, be able to apply. Right. Frankly, I would not have qualified. Uh, my under my university grade point average was not above 3.5. Right. So I, I, I think that I think um, total reliance only on numbers right. is not enough. Uh, it is not an ideal way to do it, but I think as a first start, I think it's it's a very reasonable place to start. Right. We have a package. Our best doc journalist Putri Mahira went to visit uh, Perdana University. So let's take a look.
Officially launched on 12 September 2011, Perdana University aims to contribute to the Ministry of Higher Learning's efforts of establishing Malaysia as an international hub for education by attracting students from all over the world. It offers two medical degree programs. The first, Perdana University Graduate School of Medicine in collaboration with the John Hopkins University School of Medicine offers a four-year graduate entry program based on a John Hopkins curriculum. The second, PU RCSI School of Medicine in collaboration with the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland offers a five-year program based on a conventional curriculum. So it offers the opportunity for students in Malaysia to undertake a five-year degree program, exactly the same curriculum, exactly the same assessment and examinations, exactly the same degrees as they would get if they had spent the five years studying in Dublin. Recently, I visited the interim campus in Serdang, Selangor to take a closer look at the daily activity of the students there. So two great schools under one university. Extensively uh, good facilities. Um, we have to keep pace with the advancements over there. And our programs are very IT uh, based as well. And all students are given a laptop. They could access to lecture material even before the lectures. They can go through the materials again and again. And um, all our examinations are conducted um, on the computer. You know, we have computer laboratories. So that's what goes on from Monday to Friday. It's a five-day uh, school week for the, for the students. Perdana University accepts both local and international students, creating a global classroom environment. What I love about this institution, to be honest, is the class size. I think with a small class size of 24 students in my class, we get to actually know the professors one-on-one, -on -one, and we can ask any questions we want, and they're willing to help us at any time. 80% of the teaching staffs here are experienced foreign lecturers from John Hopkins University School of Medicine and Royal College of Surgeons, respectively. I think the strength of the curriculum um, at the Pudan University Graduate School of Medicine really lies in um, the active learning strategies that we use. Uh, it's a, a unique, I think a unique element in terms of education in Malaysia. We try to steer away from solely didactic lectures and we do a lot of hands-on practical training. During my visit, I got the chance to experience what it feels like to study here. The learning facilities here is nothing but the best and world class. Students have access to state-of-the-art anatomy lab. They are introduced to new technologies in medical education such as digital learning equipment and anatomy models as well as plastinated specimens. Early introduction to clinical skills, for example, history taking and physical examination is conducted in the well-equipped clinical skills unit. Students are also taught with communication skills and physical examination are taught using simulated patients and mannequins. One of the feature here is the robotic simulated patients. These state-of-the-art computerized robots can react like a real patient. It even breathes and blinks. It can be programmed to suffer any disease required for learning purposes. The anatomy museum has plastinated and jar specimens exhibited for self-study. This is Andrew. He was a German man who wrote a will to donate his body for medical research when he died. The library has about 800 collections of books. It is equipped with various databases and a large area for students to study and conduct discussions. The programs and teaching resources at Perdana University are aimed at producing human capital with excellent knowledge, personal and interpersonal attributes and the capacity for lifelong enhancement of these attributes. Top-notch teaching staff, world-class education, 
and high-tech facilities. Those are the things that Perdana University Graduate School of Medicine has to offer. This is definitely the place for you to do your medical degree. That was very interesting package. I think Putri had the uh, time of her life being there in Pradana University and I see the facilities are very, very, like she said, it's a very top notch. Can you, can you tell us a little, a little something about the facilities that you have there in Pradana University? So I think our facilities are desi we're designed around the curriculum. I think rather than the new wave of, of developing educational facilities mm -hmm. is you look at what people do and then design buildings to help them do what they're going to do. Right. As opposed to the old way of doing it where you just design a building and you make, make do with what you have. Right. So our, our sim center, our clinical skills units were designed with the specific curriculum in mind that we're, we're teaching because mm -hmm. we already knew what that was. Our classrooms are designed for the type of experiences our, our students will be having right. to promote better interactions, um, better use of technology, right. more interactions with faculty. Right. And you, you were telling me about uh, the library that you have there. You, you don't really use the library so much. You prefer the students to be doing it. So I, th I think we're in a transition, um, kind of we're in a middle point, I, I think, in, in medical education where um, Many still like the tactile feel of books, and books right. are often very, very helpful. Right. But more and more, I think we're going to all online uh, libraries and, and such. At Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, um, there's essentially no books. Everything is available online there. And I think that's the way students are going with iPads and everything like that. I think uh, it's convenient. Uh, well, it's convenient, and it's 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 faster. It's easier. You right. can look at three different books. Um, and, and, and with one little iPad, right. you can get five different books. It's, yeah. Let's talk about the courses. Name me a few interesting courses that you currently offer in the Purdue University. So we do not use traditional courses right. that you will so uh, you will not recognize the names of courses mm -hmm. I use in general. Mm -hmm. We use the Gene Society curriculum, which we developed in 2009 at Johns Hopkins, mm -hmm. which is the first of its kind medical curriculum that is based on the new way medicine is going to be practiced in the future that is focusing on individuality, right. personalized uh, medicine, and also integrating everything from genetic, basic genetic understandings to public health. Okay. So what's different about the curriculum is that it's based on the framework of um, physicians understanding how individuals interact with their environment to stay healthy or not stay healthy. Mm -hmm. And so our, our, and our curriculum starts with that from day one. So mm -hmm. our students start interviewing patients or simulated patients, learning how to talk to patients and mm -hmm. communicate with people mm -hmm. from day one. Right. Our anatomy course that we use now is all a virtual anatomy course, right. um, heavily reliant on radiology mm -hmm. um, and virtual dissection. Okay. Uh, the students learn about public health, mm -hmm. um, basic principles of public health right up front as they're learning about genes and they're learning about organ physiology. Since the first day. So it's a, much, it's a very, very integrated curriculum. And throughout the entire four years, we, uh, the traditional way of thinking of medical curriculum is in a preclinical curriculum. And this is the way every medical school in Malaysia, um, except for Pugsam, structures their curriculum. Right. Is a dis, you know, a kind of a stark distinction between preclinical and clinical. Right. Uh, we have an integrated curriculum where it's hard to distinguish uh, between those two. Okay, we'll take a short break right now and uh, when we come back we'll uh, discuss more on uh, Perdana University and issues concerning the medical uh, uh, education and uh, so stay here on BizTalk. <laughs> Headlines, illuminating visuals, everything right and now on Bernama News.
menyelami realiti. Menjejaki masa. Meninjau peristiwa. Paparan kronikal kembara kehidupan. Pelbagai keunikan juga pengalaman menarik dari dalam dan luar negara. Segalanya disorotkan selama setengah jam dalam jurnal bernama Setiap Ahad, jam 9.30 malam, hanya di Bernama TV. Right, thanks for staying with us on Bestock. If you have any comments, you can email us at bestock at bernama-tv.com or you can tweet us at bestock502 or you can call us right now at 0326937008. And we have Professor Charles Wiener here uh, as a guest for our topic this week. Right, before we go back to Professor, we have another package done by our journalist Kyrol who went to see the president of Malaysian Medical Association, Dr. S. R. Manalan, to have his view on an issue regarding medical sciences. Insufficient or shortage of healthcare professional in Malaysia is a huge concern. Join me to discuss on the issue. Okay, I won't really say that we have a shortage of uh, doctors. Now, our PM in 2010 uh, did say that he wanted to increase the number of uh, the ratio between doctors and uh, the population. The WHO standard is one to every 400. Currently, we have one is to 600. So we want to bring it down to one is to 400. But PM's vision is by 2020, we should bring it down to one is to 200. So he has said that currently we have about 35,000 to 40,000 doctors in the country. By 2020, we hope to have something like 90,000 doctors. So right now, we are also in a, in, a, in a stage where we are learning. We are increasing the number of doctors. There are more doctors coming out and uh, more places are being created for them to, to where they can have their training. But I don't really think that uh, currently slightly short in some places, like say East Malaysia, we have shortage of doctors or some of the rural areas we have. But urban areas, I think we are quite adequate. Our doctors, why our students go overseas? Okay, the student, the reason students go overseas is most of them try to get, you see, their dream is to become doctors. And if they apply to the Malaysian University, sometimes they don't get places in Malaysia. So they tend to go overseas to try to pursue uh, the medical uh, education overseas. So that is one of the reasons. Of course, they always, then there is the other side of the coin that they think that overseas graduates are, are better than uh, Malaysian graduates, which isn't really true. But this is a perception that is there. You, you really got to look at the, the places where you are working. <clears throat> if you're looking at Malaysia, now doctors are paid in, in, in uh, government service. They are paid fairly well. And I don't think that is because it's overseas. Uh, they are paid more than in Malaysia. It's just that they think that, uh, of course, the cost of living in overseas is higher, therefore they are also paid much more. But it doesn't mean that the doctors who are in Malaysia or who are practicing in Malaysia don't have enough uh, salary. But I think uh, government is addressing that issue. Government is increasing the salary, giving them opportunities to do postgraduate studies in the country itself. So there are. Uh, a lot of opportunities there. So I don't think the salary is the only factor uh, that is keeping our doctors from, or our students from coming back to The government is coming out with more training facilities, training more of them so that they can be posted out to the smaller hospitals where the entire yeah, whether it be in Sabah, Sarawak or anywhere in this part of the country, are exposed to good medical care. So
So that, that's the government's vision. I am quite sure that's how they are looking at it. And that's the thing that they have put forward to us. That is what they want to do. Well, the, those were some issues that we are being asked to uh, the president of Malaysian Medical Association, Dr. S. R. Manalan. And uh, for you, Professor, I noticed that uh, this one, I read it from a, 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 a so-called an article uh, recently. Southeast Asia suffers from an undersupply of 1.2 million healthcare professional, and this number is projected to rise to 1.8 million by 2020. So what do you think will be the causes of this? So I think Southeast Asia is such a diverse part of the world. Right. I mean, they're, they're, and to make comparisons and, and clump all of Southeast Asia into one pot, I mean, the problems that are going on in Malaysia are totally different in most respects than the, the issues that are going on in Myanmar, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. But yet, everybody, you, you, and you, it's hard to compare Singapore and Thailand. Right. Um, so I, I don't know what to make of that number. I, there are certainly parts of Southeast Asia mm -hmm. that are tremendously underserved. Right. Um, but I think Malaysia, you know, I think the, the doctor pointed out that, that Malaysia has some specific things to deal with. Okay, and uh, some of the issues that uh, are of concern is also we have uh, graduates from overseas who doesn't want to come back and uh, to Malaysia, and also they think that if they graduate from overseas, better than you know if they are in school, med medical school in, in Malaysia. What do you think about that? So, I th a couple issues there. I yeah. think I think that the quality of the medical education uh, is is excellent in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. There's always room for improvement. Mm -hmm. I think PugSOM specifically offers a different alternative and a different approach mm -hmm. um, within the, the broad spectrum of the menu of what's available. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a good thing. I think coming the issue of Malaysians coming back to Malaysia is an important one. Right. Uh, and I applaud the government for trying to develop high quality programs within Malaysia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, interesting. Uh, but I think that part of it is that Malaysia is different from many other countries mm -hmm. that the distinction between the public facilities and the private facilities is mm -hmm. extremely stark. Right. There's almost no teaching going on right now in the private facilities, mm -hmm. whereas the vast, the bulk of all the teaching is going on in the public facilities. I think that um, diversifying opportunities in Malaysia for health professionals mm -hmm. to make it more available to do teaching, to do research, in right. addition to clinical care, right. and having a wider spectrum of opportunity would be appealing to many people um, outside of Mal many Malaysians who are outside of Malaysia. Right. And other issue is regarding the uh, doctor-patient ratio, which the, our Prime Minister wants it uh, we, to have a doctor for, for 200 patients by 2020, and that is also under the education of NKEA in the EPP where Malaysia intends to increase the number of education in healthcare or medical touch points from 55,000 in 2010 to 150,000 by 2020. Is this achievable? I, I, I can't say if it's achievable or mm -hmm. not, but I, I think what the doctor also pointed out and I think is worth emphasizing is that it's not all about just the raw ratio of numbers because right. he points out East Malaysia is different than Kuala Lumpur. Mm -hmm. Even much of peninsula of Malaysia is different than Kuala Lumpur. Right. I think what Malaysia has, which is similar to many other countries including the United States, mm -hmm. is currently a maldistribution of physicians right. such that there are many, many of uh, plethora of physicians in downtown Kuala Lumpur, mm -hmm. but a, a scarcity in other places. Right. I also think that the other thing he didn't touch on that I think, uh, or, or was edited out, was the, um, the undersupply of specialists, right. which I think is, is another pressing problem. Mm -hmm. um, Malaysia's healthcare system is very much built on a system of health that was based on the 1960s and 70s. Mm -hmm. Um, the health of Malaysians is changing dramatically in the past 15 years, mm -hmm. and I personally believe that the healthcare system should be anticipating what the health of Malaysians is going to look like in the next 20 years okay. and thinking and planning in, in that regard. Right. And uh, in your opinion, what should we regard? What should we take, uh, take note of? So it's important, uh, there's an important um, distinction that in, in the United States, for example, and in Canada, mm -hmm. um, specialists the word specialist is used differently in the West versus in Malaysia. Right. Um, in the West, a primary care physician mm -hmm. is an internal medicine physician, a family doctor, or mm -hmm. a pediatrician, or mm -hmm. an OBGYN. Whereas in Malaysia, that's considered a specialist. Mm -hmm. 
I think that the government has identified that there is a um, undersupply of specialists, particularly in those fields, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, right. OB, and that training programs in Malaysia should be enhanced to um, more rapidly supply the public with those people, mm -hmm. particularly given the hiring, the increasing um, rise of diseases like cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So right. I think obesity, um, I think that in addition to s just focusing on numbers, mm -hmm. I think that we as the healthcare professionals should be thinking on distribution and specialty training. Right. Don't you think by, you know, having that kind of number, 55,000 in 2010 to 150,000 by 2020, that's only seven years from now. And we are trying to increase 100,000 um, medical people. Don't you think the quality could be, you know, that is ambitious. Yeah, that it's is ambitious. But do you think the quality would be as great as so, the number? So I think if if you def defends depends also on how you define healthcare professionals. Right. Um, and and again, uh, there are if you look at what's going on in uh, the UK, Canada, America, the greatest rise in healthcare professionals who are delivering care mm -hmm. is in people who are not physicians mm -hmm. who give out excellent care for primary care disorders. Mm -hmm. In, in, uh, in, in many rural and uh, underserved settings. So right. I think that broadly defining healthcare professionals beyond physicians mm -hmm. and thinking in terms of systems of care mm -hmm. is the way we should be thinking about improving Malaysian health right. rather than just focus, it's, it's just easier to, it's easier to quantify numbers. Right. So what do you think, in your opinion, what should we do in order to, for us to produce good quality doctors rather than just numbers? I think that focusing on the curricula in medical schools mm -hmm. and making sure that students have adequate um, contact hours with patients, mm -hmm. focusing on uh, curricula where students are given accountability to learn professional values mm -hmm. and professional skills, mm -hmm. and also developing training programs after graduation that enhance um, the practice and the training of medicine with an eye for what Malaysia's needs are right. is the way things should go. Right. Let's go to the next question. How important is that the role getting access to financing or funding to promote clusters in the sector? Again, I think, I think Malaysia is in a um, kind of a turning point in terms of their healthcare financing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, a, a universal healthcare insurance system mm -hmm. uh, in the government, which I think uh, sounds like a, a very laudable goal, giving mm -hmm. everybody equal access. And I think, so I think that the healthcare system in Malaysia is, in a, is kind of in an evolving system right. where insurance companies are figuring out what do they want to cover, who will they cover. Right. The government is trying to figure out what is affordable. Right. Um, and again, I think it gets back to this, this kind of stark distinction between public and private. Right. Um, that I, I would personally like to see a blurring where there's less distinction between the purely private and the purely public. Right. Could you tell us a little bit what would Paksum do in line with this uh, NKEA that we have right now? So we are in the process of developing um, a hospital, uh, Perdana University Hospital, that will also be in affiliation with Johns Hopkins, that is meant to be a um, kind of a model, of a, di a slightly different model than what's most prevalent in Malaysia, mm -hmm. that is a private teaching hospital right. where students will be working with physicians, where we will be training specialists uh, to address the healthcare problems of Malaysia, mm -hmm. where research and clinical care are integrated very, very seamlessly. Um, so I think that's what we're trying to do. We're not going to pug psalms we're small classes. We're not. Right. We're not going to generate hundreds and hundreds of doctors. Right. We're focusing on quality. Right. We're focusing on producing the people who will lead um, in those three missions in the future mm -hmm. and influence other people in a exponential fashion. Right. Okay. We'll stop uh, for a short break, and when we come back, we'll discuss more on uh, medical education. And uh, right here on Bistock. <laughs>
Segalanya baru dan benar hanya di Berita Dunia. Girang Gemilang atau Peluk Kecundang. Paparan kegairahan, laporan sukan dan persempadan, wadah bertenaga dan terkini sukan at Bernama TV. Right, thanks for staying with us on Best Talk. If you have any comments, you can email us at besttalk at bernama-tv.com or you can tweet us at besttalk502 or you can call us at 03-2693-7008. Right, we have another package and this time is on the public's view on the current medical issues that they are having. So let's take a look. Health is the most important factor for a happy life in this modern era People demand for a better healthcare facilities and services. Now, let's hear the public's opinion on this issue. A uh, government hospital actually they have all the facilities, uh, and they don't simply waste money. Uh, they do things appropriate according to the situation, uh, which has to be done. That's how they will do it. They don't simply make money. Normally, uh, before I used to go to university hospital, but my friend recommended me to go to DH because of the price. I think we have very good facilities compared to many other countries. Like, you know. I should encourage uh, more, more doctors. The population is getting back, uh, bigger and bigger. So I think uh, we got to uh, multiply the uh, doctors. Like. I've had one, I, but some clinic okay. Not that I'm still very really good. Some clinic okay, but some clinic Just pay money or just keep medicine, that's all. Uh. From the public's opinion, we find out that the government hospitals remain a preferred choice for them. I'm Kalevani Munsami for Bistok. Right, thanks Kalai for that uh, public's opinion. So most of them said that we need more doctors, but we've discussed on that. And there's another issue which is about the payment. The clinic payment on the public and private sectors. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah. So, I, I and on the facilities as well. I think that, again, I think that uh, it sounds. It seems to me from my my reading and my experience that Malaysia is kind of in in a transition place between right. the purely private clinics and the the um, the outstanding. Uh, care in, in the public hospitals, which are often very, very crowded. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some kind of middle ground uh, is probably the optimal place where uh, patients can get, have a full access to quality comprehensive care that's mm -hmm. appropriate, mm -hmm. um, that is not purely a, uh, necessarily a fee-for-service model. I right. think that's where much of the world is going. Okay. But do you agree that healthcare personnel, although referred to as professionals, lack of quality and professionalism both in public and private sector? So uh, this is a big movement in medical education, the whole issue of professionalism. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I think in many places physicians have lost the public trust, True. Um, and 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 the healthcare profession should be a, an avocation. Mm -hmm. It should be a calling. It should not be a business proposition. Uh, I think many students, if you look at the attrition rates in many of the undergraduate medical schools, they're on the order of 10, 20 percent, which mm -hmm. is to me is way too high. Mm -hmm. I think part of that is because students are going into medicine at times for the wrong reasons. Right. I think that's another advantage of PugSOM's graduate entry model, where mm -hmm. you take more mature students who've had a chance to think about what they want to do, often separate from their parents' wishes a little bit by right. time and maturity, <laughs> True. Um, and, and go into medicine for the right reason. Right. Um, there are very few physicians in the world that are, that are starving, that can't provide for their families. Right. Um, but at the same time, it, to me, it should not be a, a profession mm -hmm. where uh, the It's main reason... Business. It should be about improving health. Yeah. That's what it should be about. But the thing is, in Malaysia, the mindset is like that, you know, especially parents, old parents, they said, you know, I want you to become a doctor because I want you to earn this much, this much. So how could we actually change that bit by bit? I'm 
We're trying bit by bit at, at Perdana. I'm looking to, I'm trying to train a, train a gen, next mm -hmm. generation. Mm -hmm. Look at what's happening in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, in Australia, the, the strong trend is for, uh, for like a, a graduate entry model. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's, it's up to physicians everywhere, no matter the model, to earn back the public trust by uh, maintaining their primary job mm -hmm. is to preserve health. And there's great physicians in mm -hmm. Malaysia mm -hmm. um, and, and much of the, this part of the world. And I think that uh, it should be taught in medical schools that um, the public trust is one of the core values of a physician. Mm -hmm. But the public trust, as for now, most of them are complaining. They're not, they like I said, lack of professionalism and lack of quality. And even, even supporting medical staff on occasion say that they're not up to par, up to that standard. So what could we do to actually, especially the ones that are already in the healthcare uh, uh, so-called industry. So how could we educate these kind of people? So I, th I think that, uh, well, it's hard to teach old dogs new tricks. <laughs> okay. um, I think, but medical school curricula that emphasize communication skills, mm -hmm. emphasize professionalism, mm -hmm. emphasize multidisciplinary care. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a large part of our curriculum is teaching doctors how to communicate with nurses and mm -hmm. other healthcare professionals. Right. And I think many schools are going to uh, those kinds of curricular things. And I think that as that happens from the ground up, I think it's going to happen to have to happen from the bottom up. True. Um, but I think as it will take some time. I'm it guessing. will take time. Okay. But I think that there's a, um, by introducing multidisciplinary care in hospitals, mm -hmm. physicians have to realize that the best care is by uh, by enhancing communication skills. Right. Okay. Let's go back to the high medical costs. Okay. Building a health science education discipline cluster is laudable, but there's a debate on high medical costs. So where do we draw the line between providing medical care and profitability? So I think we should start with enhancing health. Okay. Um, I think that enhancing health should be cost effective. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, again, there's a, uh, I know the U.S. best, mm -hmm. there's a tremendous maldistribution of costs. Right. Where in the United States, which spends a lot more money on health than Malaysia and right. inappropriately spends a lot of money, right. um, much of the costs are at, at the end of life um, a disproportionate amount of money is spent at the end of life, mm -hmm. whereas a disproportionate undersupply is spent mm -hmm. in primary care and preventive medicine. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, the emphasis of health care should be on enhancing health. Right. Can you, can you elaborate on enhancing health? Enhancing health is by looking at public health measures, right. preventive medicine, mm -hmm. continuity medicine, mm -hmm. um, personalized medicine, mm -hmm. um, not testing unnecessarily mm -hmm. and not prolonging life unnecessarily also, right. not providing uh, care for the wrong reasons. Okay. I think that can be financially, fiscally responsible care mm -hmm. um, without gouging people or without um, focusing only on the profit motive. Right. Okay, let's uh, take a break right now. And uh, when we come back, we'll talk more on uh, medical education right after this on Bistock. Catch Panama today every weekday from 9am onwards for the latest news, lifestyle stories, interesting personalities, only on Panama TV. Assalamualaikum Chu. Waalaikumsalam. Ada apa nenek tua? Nenek nak tanya sikit ni. Tanya apa nenek? Ah, uh, Chu ada nampak Mila tak? Tah. Mila. Apa dia cakap kat nenek? Mila punya. Apa khabar nenek? Pura-pura baik konon. Dahlah Mila, ni kita balik. Tulang kau tak ada harap dengan orang tu lagi. Aduh, aku mana tahu. Melepas. Nongkah batasan masa. Mengupas isu semasa. Jadi saluran pelbagai suara. Segalanya baru dan benar di 
berita bernama TV. Right, thanks for staying with us on Best Talk. If you have any comments, you can email us at bestdoc at bernama-tv.com or you can tweet us at bestdoc502 or you can call us right now at 0326 937 Right, we have a couple of Twitter questions for you and let's take a look at the first question. Qualify for production. So Ms. Lee uh, is commenting on the scholarship program. Right. So all of our Malaysian students mm -hmm. are on a full scholarship from the government okay. currently. The way to um, qualify is you have to get admitted to PUGSAM first, mm -hmm. and then you subsequently apply to the JPA for a scholarship. Right. So the entry uh, criteria we already mentioned, mm -hmm. the, the grade point, uh, having a first degree, doing, doing well in your first degree, mm -hmm. then going through the interview and the application process of PUGSAM, right. and then the accepted students we uh, propose to the JPA for uh, their own um, application they fill out for the JPA scholarship right. they interview and um, so far our students have been tremendously successful and all of our current, current students all of our current Malaysian students are on JPA scholarships right how about okay besides science what kind of uh, background do you need besides science if so, they have uh, besides science so yeah. we want people who have done things to um, show us that they are interested in improving health okay we look for people who've done research who volunteered in the community mm -hmm. who have active interests we're looking for diverse people we're right. not looking for people who have been programmed to go to medical school their whole life right and have done it has nothing to else have interest we want multi-dimensional people right let's take a look at the uh, second question second Twitter question right now this is from Warren91. Will there be any branch campuses from Perdana University, especially in East Malaysia? So, so Warren's trying to keep me awake more than I'm already awake. <laughs> okay. uh, we are working hard to build the Perdana campus. Right. We're building a hospital. We're building an educational facility, a mm -hmm. research facility. We've got a lot of work to do. Right. Uh, we uh, are very interested in East Malaysia. I was actually uh, I visited uh, KK not that long ago okay. and a number of our students are from East Malaysia and mm -hmm. we're hoping they go back. Right. At this point I have no plans for a, uh, a branch campus but everything's possible. Um, in East Malaysia or West Malaysia, do you have any other plans? In uh, right now we're focusing on building our current our campus. Mm -hmm. We're planning on opening our hospital in the next three years, mm -hmm. having our, our permanent educational campus which will be even nicer than our interim campus uh, ready in that time frame also. Right. Okay, let's go back to the medical cost. I just have another question. There are grouses that some doctors, especially in the private sector, dish out expensive treatment when they should have started out with basic, you know, cheaper treatment in treating diseases such as cancer or heart healing. So how can we pre prevent this and how could the public know about you know, so that they know that they are not being treated unnecessarily. So uh, there is often a, a gray and a, a subtle distinction between necessary and unnecessary. It's not as stark as necessary. And, I mean, there are things that are clearly necessary and things that are clearly unnecessary, mm -hmm. but 90% uh, of decisions are somewhere in that, in that boundary zone. Right. I think an educated public is the key to um, holding doctors responsible for their views, we, uh, questioning public. Right. I think doctors should be able to explain why they think what they're recommending is the right thing. Right. This gets back to doctors, physicians' communication skills. Right. I should be able to explain to you why the pros and the cons of my decision-making mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. and be able to tell you here's why I think what I recommend is the best right. and it should be independent about I should not have a financial self-interest in your decision. Right. That gets back to the public trust. Okay. We only have a couple of minutes more, so let's conclude this. So what is in store for Perdana University? So what's in store? We're, we're being very ambitious. Uh, okay. We are planning um, a beautiful campus that mm -hmm. I, uh, I hopefully will be breaking ground very, very soon. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have an integrated campus that combines a hospital mm -hmm. that right now is being planned for 600 beds. Oh, okay. Will be um, arguably the first private teaching hospital in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. It's going to be built with 
an emphasis on training and high quality care. Right. We're building education, integrated education research facilities mm -hmm. that where everybody is going to be together and collaborating both on the research side, on the education side, and mm -hmm. the clinical side. Okay. We're hoping, uh, we're planning on having all that finished within the next three years or so. Okay. Uh, it's, and it's being designed by an international team. I just re returned from uh, Johns Hopkins mm -hmm. where an international team from KL in the United States was working on the plans for that campus. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Professor for being with us and uh, giving us some inputs on today's topic and uh, thank you so much for tuning in with us on BizTalk and until we meet again real soon I'm Sureti Sanusi, thank you for watching, goodbye